I'm going to give um, give you two lectures, one after the other, lecture 10 and lecture 11. And uh, I have already posted uh, the lecture on robocasting. So this should conclude all the lectures that uh, I want to give you on this topic. Um, there are um, quite a few and quite a uh, uh, wide variety of topics that we have discussed in this uh, class. And I hope that this will cover most of it. Anyway, um, so uh, we talked about uh, polymers and composites in the last lecture. And uh, we will talk about uh, polymers and metals uh, sp specifically related to bioengineering and tissue engineering. So there are many different techniques. Basically, they can be um, for uh, biomaterials. You can divide them into two. And the first technique is uh, uh, you are not going to be using any cells at all. Uh, you are just going to be using or creating scaffolds, uh, porous scaffolds that can be then used to um, implant into a body or to get covered with different kinds of biocompatible cells that can then be implanted into a patient. The cellular techniques are specifically related to actually extruding or to infusing different kinds of cells into shapes and forms that are biocompatible. So that's a different technique. I'm not talking about that because that is still a why um, there is still going to be a lot of uh, um, discussions and controversies related to cellular techniques. So I'm not going to uh, discuss that at all. So we will only talk about different kinds of techniques related to binder jetting, direct energy deposition, materials extrusion and jetting, powder bed fusion which we talked about earlier and VAT polymerization. So what are the benefits of additive manufacturing and specifically related to tissue engineering? There is going to be a huge need for body parts replacement because we have a huge change in the demography of our aging population. So since 1999, the bone substitution and biology sectors have grown by more than five. I mean, I would even say that that's, that's almost as close to 1,000. And in the U.S. alone, there are 250,000 bone graft procedures annually. So there is a great interest in tissue engineering and so new types of materials and new approaches to make them. So this is supposed to exceed $10 billion by 2020. And what do they use mostly nowadays? I mean, what, what is the most common material that is used. Um, they use autologous bone or cadaver bones or maybe bones from animals like pigs and uh, um, uh, pigs and cow cows and things like that. And especially in the late 90s to early 2000s, there was a huge challenge related to uh, animal bones because of the mad cow disease. So people started saying, you know, hey, this is not acceptable, so you have to come up with new materials. And so additive manufacturing was recognized as the, the method for these approaches. So the current problem is that most of the technology that they are using now is only for show and tell. And it's because most of the polymers that they are using, um, as soon as you implant into the body, within a couple of months, they lose all the strength. And especially if it is a resorbable material, they become too weak to carry any load. For example, if it is polyglycolic acid, 
which is a natural material and it is very very biocompatible it loses its strength in one week and it loses all its strength in four weeks um, and but and also as i said collagen based products are not very good materials so the best method is to use what are called autologous bone which is coming from cadavers or um, animal products but there is only a limited amount of bone to transplant and if the person's the site where you are implanting these bodies have some kind of issues then it complicates the healing process so without healing there is no point in implanting these materials into that of course there are uh, uh, metal based implants but metal based implants have their own challenges because our bone is not very strong and metal based um, implants are extremely strong so you are going to be rubbing an extremely strong material against a weak material so these implants can turn out to be not what are called osteoconductive that means the cells are not going to love the implant and start growing on them in order to integrate this implant into our body of course there are uh, materials that you can implant onto that metal implant in order to make it like like you know you can put a coating um, and make it compatible but still what also happens is that because the uh, material is extremely strong over a period of time it starts breaking off pieces of our bone and so you may start with a hole of size say for example in your hip implant the whole size might be say 5 millimeters over a period of time it becomes 7 millimeters or 10 millimeters so you are going to be active so the more active you are the more that metal implant is going to rattle around inside that hole so that means after 10 years 15 years you have to go for what is called a revision surgery so which means that you have to put a new implant that is larger than what you started out with so that's not and this process of breaking off the bone is called osteolysis o s t e o l y s i s okay so uh, if you are interested you should go and look at that so the most common one is additive manufacturing of natural biopolymers the natural biopolymers are the one of the most common ones is called collagen it's a very soft material and it is present in our extracellular matrix but because many of these additive manufacturing processes need to be heated or um, they are not uh, dry so you can't form them into powder and put them into a selective laser centering process or an extrusion process but people have tried what are called cryogenic plotting systems and that also helps you to introduce what are called growth factors um, and that uh, those growth factors will allow the bone cells to integrate into that implant and start growing on top of that uh, there are also been uses where you know they have made an indirect fuse deposition pro uh, mold uh, into which you um impregnate this collagen material and then you slowly uh, you either dissolve it or you heat it up slightly so that all the uh, plastic or all the wax is uh, melted out and then you end up with only the uh, biopolymer that is porous that has been done um there have also been cases where you can use gelatin but of course the problem with gelatin is that it comes from an animal by product so and 
so some of some of us who are vegetarians or vegan um, won't like to do that won't like to use that or sometimes you know because of mad cow disease and things like that you don't want to use gelatin but the advantage is that it is very inexpensive shows excellent biodegradability biocompatibility and it doesn't allow any kind of uh, in, uh, infection to take place so it can be used for hydrogel formation and vessels for controlled drugs release so if you impregnate these dr drugs into this gelatin over a period of time the gelatin will start slowly degrading and release this drug into the bloodstream so these are typically constructed printed using material extrusion of course there are also uh, cases where you have used the people have used um, novel techniques such as stereolithography a modified stereolithography technique to prepare gelatin methacrylate but that's a uh, methacrylate and methacrylates over a period of time can lead to issues in some people and some patients so it is not a very well accepted technique but of course uh, people do that and still get away with it so that is um, that uh, there are also other natural biopolymers such as starch cellulose chitosan etc uh, but they are not used for um, for uh, as in applications such as gelatin or uh, hydrogel they are used as biocomposites and for achieving better mechanical or biological properties and these are mostly made using binder jetting type of process so it's a pbf process or you know you may want to create what are what is called a porous scaffold and then you infiltrate that porous scaffold with a polylactic acid polycaprolactone copolymer solution for improving their mechanical properties so uh, it's a it's a com combination process in order to get the right kind of biocompatibility there are also synthetic biopolymers such as polycaprolactone polycaprolactone is a very commonly used biopolymer it has got excellent biocompatibility and biodegradability and it comes from an ester it has a lot of ester linkages and when it gets exposed to blood type of uh, environment it degrades into carbon dioxide and water so it's used as a feedstock material for extrusion based additive manufacturing and uh, the compressive stiffness and compressive yield strength etc they are affected by the way you um, what kind of build pattern you are using and what kind of blade on patterns you are using in these materials you also have um, other materials such as polyglycolic acid etc polyglycolic glycolic acid polylactic acid or their copolymer polylactic acid polyglycolic acid so it is a 50 50 polylactic acid polyglycolic acid and the advantage is that these materials naturally occur in our own body in the uh, areas where we have our bone joints like you know it it is found in our knees it is found in our uh, um uh joints where two sets of bones are joining together i mean in inside our uh, um inside our shoulder blade inside our hip etc um and the other interesting thing is that it is produced by various renewable sources such it comes from um corn starch tapioca root sugarcane etc so um one company that is doing um, that is making these materials uh is um i forgot the name of the company they are they are from illinois if you are interested you should go and look it up and find out what the name of that company and there are other forms of pla uh, etc copolymers um and the interesting thing is that you can tailor their biodegradation rate depending upon their crystallinity 
Okay. Um, the, the other common synthetic biopolymer is called bioglass. It is a ceramic material containing uh, phosphoric, uh, um, phosphoric oxide, silica, calcium oxide, uh, sodium oxide, calcium oxide, etc. in different ratios. Um, and some of these are um, commonly available is 45S5 and 5S4.3. Um, and depending upon the type of bioglass, they can be used for different kinds of applications. So for binding bone and soft tissue, you use 45S5 and uh, uh, for uh, um, bone tissues alone, you use the 5S4.3. Its major advantage is is fantastic bioactivity because it can you can activate and you can accelerate its bioactivity the rate at which cells grow on top of that. Um, if you have bioglass, any kind of bioglass, of course it's a, it's a glass, so which means it is crystalline, so which means it is brittle. So you can pack it and put it into a location, but you cannot make an actual load-bearing component. So that's a big disadvantage. Um, they have used uh, additive manufacturing based uh, on extrusion and VAT polymerization for these materials, but they are not the uh, most um, universally accepted uh, process for bioglass. It's a, it's a research curiosity still. Then the other most common one is metallic biomaterials. Okay, the most common one is titanium-based process uh, for uh, for uh, Ti64, uh, and it is made using selective laser melting, selective laser sintering, uh, direct uh, laser melting, etc. You also have cobalt chromium alloys which is used for hip implants. Of course, they are made using casting and then machined. The interesting thing is that cobalt is not a biocompatible material. Chromium is not a biocompatible material. But when you make that into an alloy, chromium cobalt is one of the most biocompatible materials. Sometimes they even say that it is more biocompatible than even Ti64. So, but nobody knows whether um, these materials can dissociate into the individual uh, metals or not. You also have uh, steels, stainless steels are used, but stainless steel can be over a period of time could possibly be degraded or corroded by blood. Why? Blood is the most corrosive liquid known to us. So Ti64 doesn't get degraded at all by blood. There are new materials such as magnesium or magnesium alloys and these are um, brand new materials in the market go look up medical magnesium and rice business plan competition they won over a million dollars in investment funding from different groups this year at the rice business plan competition and this company uh, is made by some students from um, a university called rwth Aachen, A A C H E N from Germany, and um, there is also a medical institute called Hanover Medical Institute, H A N N O V E R Medical Institute in Germany that is working on these materials. And the interesting thing is that this project was originally funded by the National Science Foundation uh, to a few universities in the United States, 
and uh, RWTH Aachen took that and made that into a commercial product. So you can see that even though some of these materials, it takes them a while for uh, them to get to the market, they can be um, interesting too for the future. So titanium and alloys are very popular materials. They have excellent biocompatibility because they have excellent resistance to fatigue, loading and corrosion. And uh, the interesting thing is that they have very high strength to weight ratio, so which means they are lighter than other met metallic materials, but they have some drawbacks because their mechanical properties are much better than our natural bone. So it can lead to osteolysis, reversion surgery, etc. over a period of time. So this is the general structure and for those of you who are metallurgists, um, it can lead to what are called Wittmann statin uh, type of uh, structures. You can see that you know there is a it's a combination of alpha beta um, alloys. So you have areas where alpha phase is predominant and where you have phases where there is beta phase that is predominant. And because of the way these materials are laid down, so there can be a predominance of alpha phase over the beta phase. So um, you could probably heat treat that and try to relieve those stresses and try to make the uh, material uniform, but people don't often do that. Okay, so um, that will conclude most of these materials. And now I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that I did about 15, 16 years ago. And before describing that, let me talk to you about what are ideal bone substitutes, especially related to additive manufacturing. The first and the most common requirement is that they need to be osteoconductive. So which means that the biocompatible material should allow bone attachment and should allow the cells to come and attach themselves. And then there should be pore structure allowing the bone cells to grow inside and vascularize. So which means that the cells inside need to be able to get the blood and food for them to grow. And the next one and the most important one is that it needs to have enough mechanical properties to support the growing tissue and for example if you have a hip implant you are going to be putting on a lot of weight on that hip implant so it should not just dissociate and break into a thousand parts that means the whole purpose of this implant is gone so they need to have enough strength till the body grows its own bone cells into that implant of course, we would like that to be osteoinductive, so which means that it needs to recruit and differentiate these cells into the bone tissue. Uh, you can do that by adding what are called growth factors into the growth graft material. So these growth factors will allow these cells to pro proliferate and grow very rapidly and fill that hole, fill that gap very quickly. So which means that if you have a gap, if you have a broken bone and if you have a gap that you are trying to fill with these cells, you can do that very quickly. Of course, um, you would like them to be what are called osteogenic in nature. So that means these new bones have to grow from the cells present within the graft material itself. So you, have, you are culturing these graft material with cells that allows the bone cells to grow from scratch. So in our case we created what is called plasti bone. So we had a biocompatible scaffold material and we created a template for the bone growth 
and we create we put on an osteo inductive coating we used beta tricalcium phosphate beta tcp particles suspended in a polycapitalactone binder and then we also added growth factors and antimicrobial agents and we could coat them with uh, stem cells etc uh, before implantation so this had the potential to meet the gold standard for implants so when you go talk to customers or when you go talk to investors you have to present your data in this form you have to talk to them about what are the features what are the advantages and what are the benefits so we had this list of features advantages and benefits for our technology which we call plastibone if you google that you will see my name plastered all over the place so i was held on to plastibone like um like an adhesive what we did was we used an um extrusion based free form fabrication process so this was mainly because the polymer that we were using was polybutylene terephthalate which was very very high temperature polymer so it had to be melted around 300 plus degrees centigrade and in order to do that you had to heat it up very highly and the standard um stratasys machine could not do that so we retrofitted these materials with our implant uh, our extrusion uh, head and that would deposit that into the shape and form that we wanted so these are the uh, manufacturing steps that we used so this is the uh, cad model and so you can design the cad model directly from the mri data that we get from the uh, for example if your left arm is broken you can use the right arm and reverse that to create the type of bone structure that you need and then you created this um, and this is the shape that we wanted okay so you created a micro ct model and then we used cat software to add sites for strain gauge placement because we wanted to see whether the uh, cells were actually growing or not uh, and then we created that and we implanted that into the body um, we also looked at um, the degradation profile what we found was that we could easily tailor the degradation process by controlling the thickness of this biocompatible coating so it can remain in place for at least 3 months which would enable the new bone tissue in growth vascularization and mineralization so after that you it can just fall off you don't care because your bo body has grown its own bond bone into that gap the other nice thing was that it was pretty strong so which means that over a period of time it can retain its strength and still match that strength with our own natural bone so which means that you can avoid what is called the process for revision surgery so what we found is that when you put this coating it nicely coated these implants the the spokes the lock piles were coated with this uh, hydroxyapatite polycapitalactone coating and then you could seed them with cell and then they started growing the cells on top of that so if it doesn't ball up and if it is nicely spread on top of these coatings that means that these our cells like these coating but if they start balling up that means they do not like them so in this case we found that they were nicely spread and it liked the coating so which means it was a biocompatible coating and we implanted that into the femur of a dog or rat's femur and held in place by resorbable and we have done this on the um implant locations for dogs also 
and it was found to have nicely um, absorbed, uh, resorbed and also allowed the bone cells to grow into them. So here you have these scaffold materials, you create the new bone and this is the underlying bone structure. So which means that this new bone structure started going into all these um, areas where there are porosities and this is after four months. So which means that there is no um, problem with these implants at all. And you can also see what are called the osteons and um, all these uh, blood vessels that are growing into these because those blood vessels are what delivers the food to the new implant sites, new look, uh, growth, uh, bone cell growth sites. So we did these and we implanted them into the joints uh, of, of, of their uh, feet. And what we found is that if you loaded them by letting them walk on a treadmill, these cells would grow much faster. So which means that loading them allowed these cells to grow fast and they would still allow these bone cells to grow into them. And the, the reason why we did this project was this was a project funded by the Office of Naval Research and they wanted to see if we could provide them with a uh, with a method to implant uh, for lower extremity type of wounds and whether we could avoid the revision surgeries that these soldiers have to undergo. Um, we proved the concept but unfortunately the army decided to not to continue this research anymore and uh, uh, of course the other interesting thing is that there are a lot of people who have taken this idea and they are doing similar things now. So they all have to refer to our work that we did 15, 16 years ago. So uh, you could do like, you know, this, this was with the polycaplactone or uh, poly, um, polycaplactone, polyglycolic, polylactic acid, polyglycolic acid composite and we made that into a porous structure and we did that uh, we also made it them with uh, uh, beta tricalcium phosphate added to this polycaplactone etc and uh, we made them into lock pile type of structures and we showed that they allowed the growth of the cells to grow into those uh, into those porosities So it had a nice coating with hydroxyapatite which was very nice and smooth and uniform. Um, and the durability of the coating still needed to be done. We, we, we stopped the uh, test at that point of time. So uh, I would like to bring this to your attention even though I have not covered it in the lectures, um, I would like you to do, I would like you to go and find one paper that talks about additive manufacturing of soft biological materials and write one paragraph about the AM process for such materials. Okay, so um, let me switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, metallic forms. This was also something that we did about 15-16 years ago. Um, so we looked at the way to make metallic forms using additive manufacturing. Um, we also looked at making graphitic forms for thermal management using additive manufacturing. So why were we interested in um, metallic forms? Because metallic forms are very lightweight materials. They have like, you know, 0.05 to point, I mean, so 5% to 30% of the weight of aluminum, but they would have very similar strength and compressive strength properties compared to aluminum itself. 
and most of it is done by molten metal or powder processing and they would just blow gas through that and create these pores. It's a very uh, energy inefficient process um, and you don't always get open cell or closed cell as you need. So what did we do? We added these individual powders and we added a binder that would create these gases during the processing and create porosity inside the material. So we were able to get approximately um, like you know it's almost 85% uh, uh, aluminum and we did that with 50% binder um, and this is the kind of foam that we created. So you create these pores here that are here but they also created these foams inside these each individual spokes and these internal porosities were created by the way the binder burnt out inside the material during the binder burnout process and when you sintered them these pores became larger so this turned out to be like you know 50 percent or we could even uh, create like uh, 30 percent 35 percent uh, uh, density of fully dense aluminum You create these. I mean, you create these porosities by the way you lay them, lay the material down, and then we machine the outside uh, range in order to make these kinds of uh, circular shapes. Because we made these circular shapes because that was what we needed for doing the uh, compressive testing. And we also looked at um, uh, high rate testing, high impact testing, because we wanted to see if these materials could be used for. Um, armor type of applications and what we found is that these low density materials showed much higher impact properties compared to aluminum itself and they showed the right kind of properties for use as uh, use as materials for um, not barrier what is that term um, uh, armor type of applications and they still didn't break break down completely but these properties are dependent on the strain rate that you apply on them. So very high strain rate uh, actually shows a strengthening of these materials. So which means that the higher the strain you apply the stronger the material becomes and so more energy it can absorb during the impact process. And you could not have made this material by any other method other than additive manufacturing. So that's a big advantage for these materials. So when you dynamically compress them, um, they would compress these porosities, but they would still show much higher strength than the uh, uncompressed material. So when you compress them, they bulge and become, uh, they can absorb a lot of energy for the from these applications okay so this is the schematic of that so if you only had ligaments they would not show much strength at all uh, so this is the solid and this, this is the void containing solid so this would be about 50 60 percent porosity and this is the actual solid itself so even though you have reduced the weight by 40 percent they still have almost the same strength and ability to take impact. 
and compare that with open or closed cell foam. Uh, these materials are much much better than open or closed cell foam. The open or closed cell foam would just um, break up into a thousand pieces. These materials won't do that at all. So this is the damage mechanism. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into depth about that. We also made different kinds of parts with this. Like, you know, this is a green metallic foam and then when we sintered it, uh, this is called an impeller. Uh, so we made that I, and I talked about this to you earlier uh, in one of the previous lectures. So this is a sintered metallic foam. We also made what are called antenna mass. So, but we didn't have the uh, guts to go and sinter this part into this shape uh, but we were able to make the green shape using this process okay so this is the and uh, coming to graphitic forms and why were we interested in graphitic forms because uh, thermal management requires very lightweight materials that can really take out a lot of the heat very fast very quickly from your electronic structures so this is the um, on the F35 so this is the avionics rack so it needs to be able to take out the heat from the back of this um, avionics rack so Scott can probably recognize this uh, and we wanted to minimize the thermal resistance between this uh, electronic equipment and the cooling media and the only way to do that is by increasing the thermal conductivity of the heat exchanger material and the cooling media. The problem with these graphitic forms, graphitic forms are recognized as good thermal, thermal uh, uh, management materials, but through thickness, they have very, very poor thermal conductivity. So we wanted to make these materials more isotropic. And what we did was, uh, we took an indirect method. So we rapidly prototyped an indirect uh, mold and we poured this uh, graphitic foam material. So this is the actual wax mold preform. And we poured this material into that. And then while doing the binder burnout process, all this wax melted out and then you get this green material and then you would sinter this material completely. And the advantage is that when we did the thermal conductivity measurements, it was, first of all, the highest thermal conductivity that these gravity forms through thickness had ever shown was five watts per meter Kelvin. We demonstrated that we could get it up to 30 watts per meter Kelvin in all different directions. Of course, uh, unfortunately, we could not get the right kind of strength. So we haven't been able, we were not able to take this process and take it forward. And we were able to get much higher thermal conductivity. and very low thermal expansion coefficients. So these are the um, internal structures of these materials. It is a combination of coke and uh, AR pitch, uh, which, is, uh, which leads to high thermal conductivity materials. It is gel cast into a slurry form to impregnate into this form. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, robo casting. Um, it is originally, I mean, we talked about that. It's originally developed by Paul Calvert and Joe Cesarano, and um, it was modified into what is called direct ink writing by Jennifer Lewis and Jim Smay. I posted those lectures in the on D2L, so you can take a look at that. And uh, it is also being used by a company called Enscript. They are making new types of bio uh, printers 
using this process. So there are many different techniques. Uh, it can be continuous filament writing or droplet jetting process. We talked about that. So we have post, I have posted those lectures to D2L. And uh, you may want to take, go and take a look at um, the process for direct write at this uh, YouTube video. Okay, so that concludes lecture 10. And I will go and post the lecture 10 now and uh, I will also do lecture 11 tonight and post them.